Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mauro Guillén, I'm the Dean of Cambridge Judge Business School and I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, what I think is going to be a fantastic event here today, part of the student-led video series Leading Insights. Uh, we really appreciate that you're joining us today from wherever you might be around the world. Um, as Dean of the uh, Cambridge Judge Business School, um, I'm always delighted to learn about activities, about events uh, organized by, by the students. Uh, Leading Insights um, is one that aims to engage and connect uh, students within the school with global leaders of all industries and backgrounds from around the world. Um, and I'm especially excited today to be able to introduce this conversation, uh, which uh, is the last in a truly remarkable series of events uh, managed by the MBA 2020 cohort. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of the series and I cannot wait uh, to see how the series uh, grows in the future in the hands of a new cohort of students. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I would like to essentially introduce now uh, our master of ceremony here, uh, Gilad Weil, um, and uh, he will guide us uh, expertly uh, through the session here today. Gilad? Sure. Thank you, Professor Mara, for uh, the warm introduction. Um, good evening, uh, MBA cohorts from 2021 and 2022. Thanks for joining another exciting Leading Insights event. Um, today, I'm thrilled to present to you two renowned guests, Professor Jonathan Haidt and Professor Yuval Noah Harari. Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist at, a new, at the New York University Stern School of Business. He received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1992 and taught for 16 years in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. Jonathan's research examines the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultures, including the cultures of progressive, conservatives, and libertarians. His goal is to help people understand each other live and work near each other, and even learn from each other despite their moral differences. Jonathan is also an entrepreneur and co-founded organizations that apply moral and, so and social psychology, such as openmindplatform.org. He is the author of The Happiness Hypothesis, Finding Modern Truth in Ancient Wisdom. Yuval Noah Harari is a historian, philosopher, and the best-selling author of Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind, Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow, 21 Lessons of the 21st Century, and Sapiens, A Graphic History. His books have sold over 35 million copies in 65 languages, and he is considered one of the world's most influential public intellectuals today. He received his PhD from the, from the University of Oxford in 2002, and is currently a lecturer, lecturer at the Department of History at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where I have the opportunity to be one of his students. Thank you, Yuval and Jonathan, for being with us today. I shall now introduce our discussion. When looking back over the past year, the MBA class of 2021 experienced business in a very unusual manner. We learned in classes, essays, and group projects that a major part of business discipline is becoming comfortable working under uncertainty. In fact, we began to appreciate the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who said nearly 2,500 years ago that there is nothing permanent except change. Much later, and of course here at Cambridge University, Charles Darwin developed the notion of change by reaching the conclusion that surviving species are those most adaptable to change. Today, it is my pleasure to invite Yuval and Jonathan to discuss change in our own times. Stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, Gilad. Uh, I'll just start by saying what a pleasure it is that, that you've brought us together here. I've, I've admired Yuval's work for a long time. Uh, this gave me the chance to meet him and to, uh, and, and to read more deeply. Uh, at a time when we're all thinking about change and I'm getting kind of freaked out by it, kind of looking forward to uh, asking him to look into the future and maybe uh, uh, talk me off the ledge. Uh, Yuval, what, what are you looking forward to talking about? Yeah, I mean, you know, as a historian, people often ask me, uh, why do you talk about the future? You're supposed to talk about the past. And my usual response is that I don't think history is the study of the past. I think history is the study of change how things change, that's the subject. And change is now accelerating. We are seeing more change, faster change than ever before. Um, it's becoming also difficult to know what is new and what is old. 
I mean, some things that we think are very new, like fake news, have been with us always. Actually, as a medievalist, uh, originally, I can tell you that fake news were a much, much worse problem in the Middle Ages than they are today. Whereas other things are really completely new. For instance, for the first time in history, it is now possible, or almost possible, to follow everybody all the time. This was, of course, a dream of tyrants and dictators from ancient times until the 20th century. It was never possible. Now it's possible, and it's a complete game changer. So these are some of the things that history can, can, can help us understand about our own life. OK, so, um, so, so I teach in a, in a business school. Uh, I think we recently redid our, all of our branding and everything about change, you know, celebrate it, uh, you know, use it, <laughs> conquer it. Uh, everything's supposed to be about change and change is good. And, you know, we're going to teach our students to, to grab change. And this is the language that, that, business school student, that business schools use to attract students. Uh, and to, to excite them and inspire them. And most of my life I've been something of an optimist about the future and I love technology. Uh, but I have to tell you that in the last couple of years, um, I've, I've been thinking as a social psychologist, I have the distinct sense that something deep has changed so that we're in a new, we're, we're, we're in a complex dynamical system with radically new parameters that we do not understand. And I guess what I'd like to do is, is, is present to you this one really scary thing and then get you to tell me either, oh no, this is old, this is the way it's always been, uh, <laughs> or to tell me, uh, yeah, you're right, you should move to Mars or something. Anyway, mm. so here's, here, here's how it goes. If we talk about just change, change speeding up, well, change has been speeding up for a long time as you, as you convey so clearly in, in, in Sapiens. As a social psychologist, I'm interested in a particular change that happened in 2009. And that is uh, Facebook introduced the like button, Twitter introduced the retweet button, Facebook then made everything go by algorithms, Twitter changed to algorithms in 2016. And the net effect of this is that rather than just connecting people where more connection has always been good and Sapiens is sort of the story of the reunification of humanity over millennia. Um, the argument that I'm making in this new book I'm writing is that you know, the, the Tower of Babel was destroyed long ago, humanity was scattered, and then we gradually come back together. And 2011 is the peak year, techno-optimism, possibly the fall of the, you know, the Arab Spring and the fall of dictators. Technology is gonna change everything, go democracy. Um, but things got really, really weird uh, on college campuses in 2014, 2015. We had this new culture, call out culture, speeches, violence. There was a lot more fear suddenly uh, on 2014, mm -hmm. 2015 on college campuses. And at least coming from the United States, it has now spread to, to many institutions, journalism, arts, media. Many of our institutions are just like our universities. Uh, people are afraid to say anything. They're afraid to offend. They're, uh, they're mm. afraid to, to be provocative in, in universities. And my fear, my concern is that, uh, is that when Facebook and Twitter basically democratized intimidation and harassment, and you can now damage anybody at any time, often anonymously, I, my, my fear is that this has put us in a new world where we don't know what we're doing, institutions are collapsing. Maybe, it, maybe this is much more in the US than elsewhere, but tell me if you either understand what I'm saying or, or you see it elsewhere, or if I'm just totally off my rocker. Well, I think there is something old and there is something new in, in, the, in the phenomena that, that, that you describe. Um, what is old, is that every time a new information technology emerges, it changes the rules of discussion. It undermines old institutions of trust, old uh, ways of civility, of holding a conversation. Who can talk? What can we talk about? And there is a period of chaos. And this is not necessarily bad. It usually allows more people, more groups to join the conversation but we don't know the rules yet. You know, it's like we had 10 people around the table having a discussion, a civil discussion, I don't know, like they had in the 50s. And then they allowed more people, more groups to join. They said, okay, let's have some women and black people and LGBT people and so forth. And now everybody can, have, can write a blog and everybody can voice their opinion. And suddenly what happened is that so many new opinions appear. 
so many new interests, and it's becoming frightening. It's becoming chaotic. The old rules no longer apply, and we don't know what the new rules are. Um, and we've passed through several such cycles, which often are based on a new technology. Uh, a good historical example is the invention of print, or the appearance of print, in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Um, many people think that print was just a wonderful thing that uh, 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 led to the scientific revolution, but most books that were printed at that time were conspiracy theories about witches and Jews and whatever. And it took time to build new institutions of trust, like newspapers, like academic mm -hmm. uh, uh, publishers. So this is the old thing, it's, it's the old cycle. But the new thing is that there is a kind of alien presence on Earth. A new alien intelligence has invaded our life, not from a distant planet, but from the laboratories, uh, artificial intelligence. And this is, a, this is something new, it's a game changer, because unlike all previous information technology, it can make decisions on its own, it can analyze us, it can hack us. The print and press couldn't do it, the radio couldn't do it, but the new technology can do it. And for the first time in history, it is becoming possible to hack human beings and therefore also to manipulate human beings on an unprecedented scale. And we don't know how to deal with it. We really have no traditions about how to deal with it because it never existed before in history. So, so, th so the image I'm getting from you um, is, yes, there bit, every time there's new technology that changes the way information flows or the way we relate, there's a period of adjustment and there's often a lot of, there's a lot of damage along the way, the wars of religion in Europe. Um, I'm particularly concerned, I read a wonderful book by Jonathan Rauch called The Constitution of Knowledge about how, how an open society such as ours, our societies, depends on certain institutions, preeminently universities and research, um, mm -hmm. the journalism, uh, and then the courts and various government bureaus that, that do research. Mm -hmm. uh, th these, are the, these are the pillars of truth finding, and these have all now been hacked. The courts not so much yet, but that, that's coming probably. But universities and journalism have now been deeply affected and, and rendered less, uh, less useful by, by these, new, these new technologies and new trends. The image you gave us is one of, 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 of humans adapting to this, but now, as you say, first of all, it's happening much, much faster. So the amount of change that, say, the printing press brought to Europe in 50 years might be equivalent to what we've experienced in the last five years, or I don't know what yeah. the numbers are. Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, it's not just we have to catch up, it's the thing we're catching up to is now smart. And the thing we're catching up to has, in a sense, almost ideas of its own, and then you hook it up to for-profit companies, you hook it up to uh, Vladimir Putin and Russian intelligence agencies or whatever. And the image I'm having, sorry, I think in metaphors, I guess you do too, mm -hmm. is sort of like the way when you think about a supersonic jet, you know, it, approaching the sound barrier. And as it gets close, it still is sending sound out in front. But once it hits the, the speed of sound, mm. nothing else goes out in front because it's going faster than sound. So everything is an explosion at the point of contact. And the feeling I have now is that everything is an explosion and it will always be like that. Please tell me I'm wrong or that, well, what do you, what do you see? And have you gotten more optimistic or pessimistic about the future in the last year or two? Well, I, I like the metaphor very much and, and I really agree with it. And I have become also more pessimistic over the last mm. uh, uh, few years. There is really this feeling that we are venturing into completely unknown territory and it will only get worse from here on. That, you know, for the first time in history, we don't have the ability to predict the most basic things about the world 10 or 20 years to the future. Now, of course, people were never able to predict the future, let's say, of political events. If you live in the Middle Ages, you don't know, in 10 years, there might be a civil war, the Vikings will invade, the Mongols will invade, who knows? Um, but something were constant. Like, if you live in the Middle Ages, you know perfectly well how the job market would look like in 20 years. It will still be agriculture. Uh, if you want to teach your kids a, a profession, so you teach them how to harvest wheat 
and how to write the host and count and how to make a chair and whatever. And similarly, if you think about things like family structure or gender, this is not going to change in the next 20 years. And certainly, the human body will be the same 20 years from now in the Middle Ages. Now, this is no longer the case. Nobody has any idea, of course, what the political situation will be in 20 years. But we have no idea what the job market would look like. We don't know what the global economy would look like. We don't know what gender relations, what family structures would look like. And this also means that, you know, in, in, in mo most of the time in politics, for, for thousands of years, you had this tug of war between a more conservative camp that says, let's keep to our traditions, and if we have to make changes, let, th let them be small and incremental, and a more progressive camp which wants faster change. Mm. Now, it seems that the bottom is falling from below the conservative camp. And we are seeing really conservative parties around the world basically committing suicide, abandoning their key insights and their key values. For instance, stop, as conservatives, they stop conserving institutions and start attacking institutions instead. And I think what is happening is that, you know, to, to, to have conservatives, you need traditions to conserve. And the, the basic insight is, we don't understand the world very well. So before we start creating these entire societies out of nothing, let's keep the structures that work and, and change slowly. But with things like AI or like social media, there are no traditions. And the, again, the pace of change is increasing. So the, the one thing which is certainly not going to work is just keep things as they are. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that certainly fits with uh, with what's happening in the United States, where the Republican Party, which used to be a recognizably conservative party up through George W. Bush to some extent and, and uh, uh, Mitt Romney, there were conservative ideas. And I see no way to connect today's conservative, today's Republican Party or Donald Trump with Edmund Burke mm. or with any of the great conservative thinkers who, as you say, were saying, you know, slow down, let's not burn everything up. You know, a lot of what we have is a value, don't be so quick to change. And now, yes, there's just total disorientation. I think we're seeing this in populist movements around the world, uh, more right-wing than left-wing, but perhaps left-wing too. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now that we have appropriately perhaps uh, freaked out our audience, mostly business <laughs> students about the state of the world. Uh, well, you know, the bright side is that uh, it is a time of enormous opportunity because pretty much everything is open to change and success is gonna to go to those who can see the opportunities because nobody really knows what's coming in five or 10 years. You can look mm -hmm. ahead just a little bit. And then how do you train yourself? How do you prepare for this world? So um, you spend a lot more time talking with CEOs and tech people, I think, than I do. Um, what are you hearing from them? Or what, you know, what it, let, I guess what I'm trying to get says, let, let's take it from the big picture we're just in to, to, for young people going into the business world, and I presume a lot of them are going into tech, finance, mm -hmm. a lot of the areas that are really changing fast. Um, either what advice do you have for them or what are you hearing from the, the people running those businesses? Well, from the people of, at the top, I tend to hear quite a lot of fear and confusion, which is a good thing. They realize that the kind of uh, old idea, let's move fast and break things, they mm -hmm. broke a lot of things. <laughs> and they are becoming yes. concerned themselves about the, the, the way that things are breaking and things are changing. Uh, they don't really know what to do about it. Their business models are not, uh, are, are not going in the right direction. We can talk more about that, that later. Mm. But when you talk to the, to the younger people, I think the key question is who are these people and where do they live? I don't think there is a single mm. future for the whole of humanity or for the whole young generation. Yeah, yeah. If you're an entrepreneur in, in one part of the world, you should learn to code. If you're an, an entrepreneur in another part of the world, you should learn to shoot the Kalashnikov. This is what you'll need. One of, again, one of the fears of what is happening now in the world is that after decades in which you saw uh, some, some level of societies closing the gaps between them, the gaps are reopening and are in danger of becoming bigger than ever. With the new revolutions, both political and economic, especially what is being done by AI and social media and automation, 
there will be winners and losers. Some countries will be more powerful and rich than ever before. Other countries can completely collapse. And it's the same true of businesses, that more and more power, because th the nature of power is shifting. If power originally thousands of years ago was land, and you can't just cram all the land in one place, it's physically impossible. And then the main source of power was uh, industry, machines, and workers. And you could cram more of that into small areas, but it was still limited. Now power is all about controlling data and the flow of data. And you can concentrate all the data in one place which means that a few countries and a few corporations could corner all the power. Okay, but I just want to, I just want to push you to be a little more precise on your claim okay. that, there, um, that there's not a single future. So certainly if you're, if you're living in rural China or sub most of sub-Saharan Africa, but not all, um, uh, if you're cut off uh, from the sort of the, the sort of the, what I don't even know what to call it, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, some of the people on the call here are in Brazil, some are in Europe, I'm in North America. Um, if you are in South Korea or Singapore uh, or Brazilia, wherever you are, mm -hmm. you can work for almost any company now. So uh, it seems to me that there's not a single future, but there is a kind of a central hub of the open societies. Hmm. So of open societies that are connected, that have good internet, that have, that have an elite educated stratum, that is, you know, let's face it, most of us are more comfortable. I've, I've never been to, uh, I've never been to, you know, Tel Aviv or, uh, you know, the capital of Estonia, but I probably would feel more at home there than I would in most parts of the United States. Uh, mm. there's a, yeah. There is a kind of an emerging global elite in the open societies. And might it be correct to say that for them, there actually is a single future. We mm. are actually all pretty much the same now. Now that still excludes half or maybe 60 or 70% of humanity. But it's not a narrow slice. It's not just educated Americans and British yeah. people. It's, it's now sort of the global educated elite. So you'd agree with that? Yeah, d definitely. I, I, the, the border doesn't necessarily pass between countries and continents. It often passes between neighborhoods. You can live in, in one neighborhood and have one future. Mm -hmm. And like 500 yards away, there is a completely different world with a completely different future. But even for the kind of, uh, the, for the winners, there is a danger of a kind of, again, winner takes all situation yeah. when there are fewer yeah. and fewer winners. When, for instance, a few corporations not only dominate their industry, but dominate all the industries. Like you used to think that there are co uh, companies that specialize, I don't know, in computers, and there is a completely different industry which deals with cars, and another industry with textiles. So if somebody kind of becomes the, 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 the big chief of cars, the textile industry is safe. But this is no longer the case. Information becomes the key for all the industries. Even for the textile industry, the most important thing now is not the textile, it's not the machines making the shirt, it's not the workers of the machines, it's the information about the customers about what they want, what they like, the next coming fashion, and so forth. So if you are uh, at the head of the information economy of the world, you're also able to push all the competitors out of the textile industry. So you have this kind of concentration, which we have not seen before. And also, uh, returning to the still geographical or, or national level, uh, we might see a re-emergence of a kind of new kind of imperialism or colonialism. Uh, as we saw in the 19th century and, and earlier, with new kinds of data colonies and data empires, mm. that you know, the, the, the relationship between imperial hub and provinces in previous eras was that the provinces supply raw material and the imperial hub supplies the sophisticated technology. So Brazil provides mm -hmm. rubber, but Detroit may make the cars. Now, mm -hmm. uh, information and AI and data are the key. And we see an emergence of kind of data colonialism, where data is flowing from all over the world to just a mm -hmm. very few places few companies, which yeah. produce the, the key uh, uh, technologies and send it back. And, um, you know, if you look at the big 
uh, tech companies of the world, they all come now from just two places. It's either the USA or China. Right. Um, so there's a, uh, in the United States, there's a, a famous movie called The Graduate from the 1960s mm. with Dustin Hoffman. There's a very famous scene where this young college, you know, Dustin Hoffman is about to graduate from UC Berkeley. Uh, and he's at his parents' party in, you know, wealthy suburban something or other. And this, you know, business guy takes him under his wing and says, I'm going to say just one word to you. One word. Are you listening? One word. Plastics. Plastics. <laughs> you know, that's the industry to go into in 1969. Plastics. And, you know, it's funny, uh, but that's the kind of advice that was very valuable back then. And mm. then later on, you might have said, you know, computers um, or banking or something. But what you've just said suggests that maybe there is no such word anymore. It's not industry per se. It's something else. So if you were to take a young uh, re, uh, uh, this person about to graduate from college or about to get an MBA from the judge school, put them under your arm and say, I'm gonna say one word to you, one word, listen closely. What's the word? Hmm. Flexibility, I guess. I mean, I have no idea what the job market would look like in 2040 or 2050. Uh, what would be the, not only the main industries, but really the main skills. Yes, maybe, uh, the, the big tech companies will control everything, but they won't need coders anymore because AI can code. What they really need right, is philosophers. Right. What they really need okay, is wait, artists. So, okay, but so forget 2040 because things now move so fast. People, you can't just have one career with one set of skills and expect yeah. to still be relevant, unless maybe you're a professor. You know that I think we so far we've got a, a lock on the business and we've got a, a guild and all that. But um, someone graduating in you know 2021, 2022 with an MBA. They just want, you know, what's the word for 2027 or 2030? No mm. further than 2030. And so you've already said one, data, obviously data. You need to be good with data. You need to understand data, not just math, but really the meaning of data. Um, so what would, you, what would you add to that? So the other word would be probably people, humans. Yeah, I mean, okay, this good. is the, like, if you think about self-driving vehicles, the main problem, I mean, we've been had, we, we had this kind of, uh, prophecies and expectations next year, next year, the self-driving vehicles will be on the road right. and they right. are not there yet, not because of the vehicles, not because of the computers, because of the people. It's those damn people. People are complicated. Yes. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> so that's right. The key okay. is, is, is people. Okay, good. So I will add to what you said. So, you know, me being a social psychologist, a behavioral scientist, uh, uh, someone who, you know, a thing that I've been saying re recently in my talks is, the 21st century is not actually going to be the century of AI or robotics or genomics. It's gonna be the century of social science because all our problems mm. are ultimately social science problems and we are going to fail because the social sciences are not actually, we're not able to talk about things. We're not able to do, our research is not as good as it was even 10 or 15 years ago. We're walking on eggshells. We can't challenge mm. each other on certain things. So on the most important topics, we're not actually able to do our work properly. And this is again, this problem with the, the decline of our institutions. So I think uh, maybe the advice that we can give to uh, our student audience from the two of us is uh, we've got two words for you, data plus psychology or data plus humans or data plus social science or something mm. that's sort of the merging. And that's kind of the zeitgeist of the times too, you know, robotics is emerging of physical and sort of cognitive. And uh, so it's, it's, it's flexibility, it's, it, it's merging, it's not one industry but you have to understand how data works and our elite selection systems, especially in the United States, reward that kind of test taking knowledge. So we have lots of people who come out with great understanding of data, but it tends to, to not reward a good understanding of people. And so you get someone like Mark Zuckerberg, who obviously is quite brilliant. Uh, you know, you and I have each talked with him. I loved it, by the way, people should look up uh, Yuval's uh, talk with him from two years ago. There's a lot of really interesting insights. Um, but you get a lot of people designing our global systems who understand mathematical data informational systems and have very little clue how people work. And mm. these are the people who are now designing uh, the world uh, that we are living in and uh, all of the ways that uh, setting us up for all the ways that things might really go wrong. So I think that we are, um, I hope we've covered enough to uh, start some conversation here <laughs> uh, uh, to, to trigger a range of emotions, I hope. Um, and I think both of us model both a kind of an open-minded pessimism with a sense of humor. Uh, I don't know how else one can face the future. Um, 
So uh, with that, I think uh, looking at our schedule, I think we're at the time when we invite back in uh, Pro Professor Matro uh, to talk with us and then to get some questions and in interaction with the students. Thank you so much, uh, both uh, Yuval and Jonathan for such a stimulating conversation. Uh, if anything, it was too short. Um, I would have loved to continue uh, listening to you. And let me just highlight uh, over the next uh, three or four minutes here, some of what I think are the key messages so far, and then we can get into the Q and A. Um, I really like the point about um, how fear and frustration are taking over the world. And in fact, you know, I was searching throughout the conversation for well, what is the feedback mechanism? Uh, what is the, the, the dynamic here, the self-perpetuating dynamic that we don't seem to be able to, um, uh, you know, depart from, and that is essentially producing these self-reinforcing large-scale transformations that we're going through. And, uh, I, you know, it may be technology, but I think it's actually fear, frustration, and of course, the word that I don't think came up in the conversation, inequality, Right. Um, you did talk about bifurcation, how different people, even in the same neighborhood, might be experiencing what's going on in a completely different way. Um, there is no doubt that some people are benefiting from everything that is going on, whereas other people are being left behind. And um, I guess most of us are among those who are benefiting uh, from these larger scale uh, transformations. So something I think uh, to highlight um, I also like the part about uh, political parties and uh, how they are no longer recognizable, at least according to the usual lenses that uh, we would apply to politics. What I would highlight is that I think that, you know, political parties as institutions are also being undermined by this whole dynamic and that there are really, you know, two factions within each of them. I mean, there is a more conservative faction uh, that is as uh, Jonathan was saying, so much more interested in preserving institutions and traditions, whether we're talking about the left or the right, okay? Uh, and then there's also another faction in parties, which is essentially, I would say, uh, I think the best word is probably iconoclastic. And I guess that helps us uh, also make a connection to uh, the Middle Ages or even before that to uh, Byzantium and, uh, and everything mm. else, Yuval. So maybe you wanna comment on that uh, if you have a chance later. Um, as a medievalist, uh, uh, when you get uh, you start getting questions, then a couple more things that I would like to highlight, maybe from my perspective. One is uh, this whole thing about industry boundaries, right? So, what is an industry? Uh, is technologies what's going on in the world now undermining those boundaries? So the clothing and textile industry is no longer what it used to be, and uh, the recipe for success in that line of work or line of business. It has, has clearly changed, which I completely agree with. Now, as a sociologist myself, obviously industries were to begin with categories that we came up with uh, out of convenience. Mm -hmm. And they became reified through, um, I think, uh, data gathering by governments, right? So governments started to gather, gather data about the textile industry, right? Uh, to create censuses, for example. And that's how we came to essentially think about the economy as a collection of uh, different kinds of industries. And of course, the boundaries separating those industries are completely blurred. I think the best example is automobiles. I mean, automobiles have become computers. Yep. Um, even even, even uh, you know, conventional automobiles with uh, internal combustion engines, right? As opposed to electric vehicles. Uh, they have uh, in excess of 120 microprocessors each, right? So. Uh, it's really um, a different world in which I think uh, a lot of these categories that we came up with in the 19th century have become utterly obsolete, right? And then so this is a new world. Last point, uh, data, information. I don't think uh, the center of power in the economy is the repositories, the, 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 the people or the companies who have information or story or data, but it's rather, I think where the power is coming from now is from the ability to retrieve information, to circulate it, and of course, to analyze it, right? Or analyze it and circulate it. That's where the power comes from. So mm -hmm. you may not be the company or the organization or the individual who stores the information. But if you somehow 
have at your disposal the ability to retrieve it, to circulate it, to analyze it. I think that is a major source of power. But again, I offer this just as a, uh, as a footnote, um, because that was really my role here to add maybe a footnote or two. Uh, and that's what I just did. Um, so back to the organizers so that they can now handle the Q&A segment of this. And again, this was just such a treat uh, I, uh, you know, I think I will remember this evening here in the UK as being one of the most stimulating of my scholarly life. So thank you both. <laughs> That's very kind of you. I'm thank serious. You. I'm absolutely serious. This was thank very you. stimulating. Thank you, Mara. It's a really honor for us. Um, I'll pass on to a very exciting question we have here from uh, Dream Tan. Thank you for your thoughtful provoking sharing, Professor Harari and Professor Hyde. My name is Dream, a meditator in business school. I'm also a big fan of Professor Harari. I also committed to Vipassana. I would like to hear from your insights for the mindful presence uh, living a conscious life. Should we resist or draw support from technology like the brain computer interface? Because mm -hmm. personally, I'm alert to be controlled by te technology but the brain computer interface was already used in some primary school for concentration in China. So mm -hmm. I would like to hear from your insights. Well, I think it's, it's, I'm not against technology. It can do a lot of good. I think the key is to use technology for our purposes and not to be used by it for its purposes. And when it comes to things like meditation or spirituality more generally, um, we, should un we should start with the understanding that we don't understand our own minds. The people who build these technologies don't understand uh, the human mind. So it's, it, I, I would be careful about relying too much on technology in this field. For instance, some people when they meditate, they strive to have these very strong states of concentration. And they, they think that if I can have a brain-computer interface, it can help me concentrate better. But the thing is that meditation is really about coming to know our mind, not controlling it. And one of the most important things to know about the mind is that it's so hectic, it, it's so out of control, and it's so messy. So if you sit for meditation for one hour and your mind is all over the place, this is not bad meditation. This is good meditation. This is how you get to know your mind. Would you like to uh, say anything about that? No, I have nothing, nothing uh, to add. I am a, a failure at meditation. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the wrong way to say it, but you know what I mean. Right. So the, the, next, the next question um, will, will come from me and maybe uh, is, more, is more aimed at you, but, but also to you, Val. Um, so in the, just recently, we've, we've experienced one of the, I'd say the world's most impactful social media shutdowns, um, which is something that a few years ago, we would think of it as, you know, just, uh, you know, might hit a bit of the news, but, you know, then these seven hours were on the headlines, uh, global news everywhere. And uh, I wanted to ask, what do you think we are going through? Is this a, a global addiction to social media? Or is social media slowly becoming part of our nature and sort of a, an intrinsic thing we need to do like nutrition or mental health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, so I've been studying this since 2015 when it became clear that, um, that Gen, Gen Z, that is uh, young people born 1996 and later have terrible mental health, much higher rates of anxiety and depression. And it started in 2013 very suddenly uh, in the US and the UK, sort of a hockey stick pattern of depression, anxiety, self-harm, and even suicide. So I've been wondering what, you know, what has caused this, this disaster? Uh, and the two answers seem to be vast overprotection of our kids. We don't give kids normal childhoods anymore where they get to have experiences of risk. Um, but the other one is that they migrated onto social media platforms, especially Instagram, uh, between 2009 or 10 is when it began heavily. And then by 2012, they were mostly on. So, um, so I think, so I've been very interested in the harms that have happened uh, as, as we have translated, as we have moved socializing onto these platforms. Um, like Yuval, I think technology is generally wonderful. And if technology helps us talk, that's great. No harm there. If it helps me talk to my friends, that's wonderful. Uh, the difference is that um, 
is that it put us into contact in a way where, to use Yuval's words, it was no longer about serving our purposes. It was about, it got us to serve its purposes. And the most harmful thing for kids, I think, is that it got them, it basically stuck a giant, you know, well, it sort of stuck a giant data drill into their heads to suck out their attention, as James Williams puts it. Um, but also it, it, it inserted a, a reward chip in their brains so that now, uh, you know, in the way that you would train an animal by giving it little shocks or, 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 or rewards, that's now done in a decentralized way by lots of strangers. So mm. I think that hooking our children up has been completely disastrous. Uh, if you're born after 1996, your generation um, has some serious problems because your brain development was actually interfered with by these platforms. But that wouldn't have happened if they just let you talk to each other. So that's the first thing. And then the other whole set of, of issues and here's where I, th I think Yuval will have a lot more to say, is what they're doing to democracy or open societies in general. And the argument that I'm trying to develop is that in 2011, we thought that Facebook was the biggest gift to the open society ever. What dictator could withstand uh, uh, social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter? But I believe, I can't prove it just yet, but I believe, and the Facebook revelations, the whistleblower, I think are, are shedding a lot of light on this, I believe that in the contest between open societies and closed societies right now, given trends as they are, I would bet on closed societies. That is, I would bet that China will be more successful than we are. And the reason is Facebook. That is, social media in the, in the long run is the best gift to the closed society ever because it weakens us, damages us, turns us against each other, damages our institutions of finding truth. Basically, you can't have a deliberative democracy when you can no longer have deliberation. Um, so this is my provocative thesis that I think Facebook is going to really help China win the struggle for the 21st century. Yuval, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. I, I agree with, with, with your analysis, but I, I would just add a, a note of optimism that I think you, you would also agree with, that it's not the social media that is the problem. It's not necessarily even Facebook. It's the specific business model that Facebook and other tech giants have adopted uh, which is based on hijacking and controlling our attention and keeping exactly. us as long as possible on, on the platform. And, um, you know, the, the, they experimented. It's, it's like the biggest social science experiment in human history, how to keep humans glued to their screen, to their platform. And they discovered that you need to press certain buttons in the human mind, the easiest way to do it is to press the hate button, the anger button, yeah. the fear button. If you see two headlines, one is relatively calm about some mundane event, and the other is predicting that if this politician or this party will win, they will destroy the country. You have an irresistible urge, especially if you already hate that politician, to press on it and see what did they do this time. And uh, there is, a, and it's on not just Facebook; it's an arms race. The, the the scarce commodity is our attention. The way to get it is to press the fear and hate and anger buttons. And the result is 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 what what Jonathan was was speaking about. Um, and we need just need to change the business model. There is nothing wrong with technology yeah. connecting people as long right, yeah. as it is done properly. So I completely agree with you. Uh, the only question is the word just. You say we just need to change the mm. business model. So I don't think we're <laughs> gonna ever be able to do that in the United States. I'm hoping to God that the EU, the UK, other countries will change the business model. Uh, actually, it'll be a long discussion. I think there are ways to do it, but we have to make them experience a lot of pain. Uh, lawsuits, mm. heavy handed regulation, the threat of it at least, because if it's just change the business, you know, just get the most <laughs> profitable companies in the world to give up most of their profits, sure, let's do that. <laughs> well, I, again, I'm more optimistic on that front because you know it's a political issue. The problem is that it's not a political issue yet. Mm. The Good. political yes. parties we have to make it a political are not issue. talking yes. about it. I mean, what's the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in their attitude to these technologies? I don't know, they don't talk about it. So they no, should actually, talk no, about can, it. No, I can tell you what the difference is, and it's damning. That mm. is, the left, the, the left hates the social media companies because they allow all this hate speech from the right. We've got to do much more content moderation. We have to regulate them to do content moderation to shut down the right. And the right says, we hate them because they keep shutting us down. So we need more free mm. speech. So yeah, they right now they're united in hating 
tech, but for different reasons, which means they're not going to agree on a bill, which means we're not mm. going to do anything in the United States. So please, the rest of the world, you have to make this a political issue. You have to bring pain to bear on Facebook. Twitter also, but Twitter is so badly run. They're just kind of like loping around, stepping on people. They don't even know what they're doing. Mm. <laughs> this, this slides greatly into um, Chiani Shi's question about uh, countries and conflicts. Um, Chiani, are you on the line? Thank you, Gilad. Um, so my question would be, obviously, uh, as you mentioned, there has been the rising of social media, also sort of uh, making the institution that used to have the authority sort of lose a bit of trust in the public. So again, uh, we've seen sort of a divergence of powerful narratives between different countries online. Mm -hmm or even di between different groups, as you say, the social gap is widening. So it creates a lot of conflicts and mistrust and just wondering as individuals, is there anything we can do? Or when we talk to people who have a different belief in a different set of social story, is there a sort of formula we can break the gap and sort of make mm. us easily united? Yeah, actually, I'd like to take this one first because this is something that I've been really thinking a lot about. I love your question. It's like, what can, what can we do? And, and, and what I'm finding is that um, if you just read the Stoics and the Buddhists, you will be far ahead of everyone else in how to live <laughs> in this world and be effective in it. I'm very serious about this. My first book was called The Happiness Hypothesis. I just read all the ancient works I could find, took out every psychological claim and said, is it true? And the, the deepest sources of wisdom are the writings of Buddha and that tradition on consciousness and the writings of the Stoics, especially Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus, on how do you deal with this crazy world in which there's so much injustice and misunderstanding. And they both say largely the same thing on many points, which is calm down, don't judge, accept people for what they are, get control of your own reactions and move through the world despite the chaos of it. And this I believe is a superpower, uh, especially for business students. And let me tell you, I'm, I, I talk to a number of, of leaders in many sectors uh, as well. And uh, when I ask them, so how, how is it going with your young employees? If we're in private, they say, oh my God, it's like constant conflict. Somebody said something. And for a week, we're all in a tizzy because somebody said something and someone got upset. Um, many young employees are basically draining value from the company. They were bad hires. They don't know how to work with others. Uh, partly it's the stupid idea of bring your whole self to work. No, do not bring your whole self to work because if your whole self can't stand to work with other people whose whole self is there, then you can't work. So do not bring your whole self to work. Instead, bring Buddha, Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus to work and you will be gold to your employers. You will be able to thrive. You will be able to create value for others and then in the long run for yourself. Yuval, what would you say? Oh, I, I think it's, it's very good advice. And... Um... You know, I think another thing is to uh, appreciate the improvements that uh, we have managed to do in, in many fields mm -hmm. in the world. I know that some people see it as a kind of, uh, you don't acknowledge the wrongs, the injustices, the suffering that there is in the world, but it's not so. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between saying things are better than before and saying things are still bad. And it, they go together. I think things are still bad, but in many ways they are better than before. And acknowledging and respecting the accomplishment of the past generations is very important because I think it should make us more responsible. If you go around the world feeling that things are worse than ever or as bad as ever, for me the implication is that it's probably hopeless. If thousands of years since Buddha and Marcus Aurelius, people try to improve the world and failed, who do you think you are that you're going to succeed? <laughs> it's probably impossible. Maybe there is some law of nature that says that the level of injustice is the same throughout history and there is nothing you can do. Yeah. When you realize, no, some things have improved. If you think, look at gender. So yes, we are very far from gender equality, but things are better than a century ago then this should not make us smug and complacent. This should make us responsible. It shows that the situation depends on our decisions, not on some law of nature, which means that we should strive even harder. That's right. And, and part of what has happened to us, I believe, is that while the trends are unbelievably positive, if you care about social justice, just about every trend is amazingly positive. 
But social media has immersed us in an intense world full of videos of horrible transgressions. And so the, the world is getting better, but what comes into our eyes tells us it's not, and we're wrong. Um, next question from Tim Babitza. Yeah, fa th thank you very much. Um, it's, it's a true pleasure to uh, hear you both talking. I have a question about um, basically the topic that keeps us uh, busy for the last two, two years. Um, so COVID has changed our way of uh, living, including our habits and attitudes towards states. Um, states have gained, I think it's probably more interesting for you, Yuval, uh, mm. a strong role and increased their reach into also data privacy and control of their citizens in a sense. Um, it's a twofold question. First question to uh, Jonathan Hyde. Uh, from a psychological point of view, how much time is required for people to adapt to a new situation? And after which time do people stop questioning new habits and just fully adapt to them? And the second part of the question to you, Yuval, um, how can the COVID-19 crisis in history um, be a turning point or a turning point in our understanding of the role of the states uh, mm -hmm. for the next decades? Sure, so I'll take the first one briefly. Um, people are amazingly adaptive. They can change very quickly to changing life circumstances. When you become a parent, your life changes radically. We adapt to that very quickly, most of us. Um, the thing I would keep my eye on is we're, we're much more sensitive. We're not very sensitive to absolute levels of anything. We're sensitive to how things change from before and how we are compared to others. So if everyone is going through the change together, we'll adapt very quickly because that's what everyone's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if I'm forced to change alone, that would be much harder. Uh, so I think it is quite amazing. We had the first global experience. You know, we had, I mean, there was the Asian tsunami. There were a few things here and there, but those were brief. This is the first time the entire planet went through something together. And I think, uh, you know, a fair amount of good will come from that. I think it's completely swamped by the enormous uh, 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 cargo ships full of bad that, that social media has brought to us, but we've already covered that ground. Yuval? Uh, regarding the state, again, I, I'm not sure. It depends on, on the decisions we make. What I hope to see is a different understanding of the role of the state and of nationalism and patriotism. We've recently, in recent three years, we saw the rise of this ugly face of nationalism, people thinking that nationalism is mainly about hating foreigners and, and, and hating minorities and, and, and so forth. And this is a, a wrong understanding. Um, I believe that the true essence of nationalism is caring about your compatriots, loving your compatriots. And in many cases, to really take care of your compatriots, you need to cooperate with foreigners. And the pandemic is a perfect example that if you really care about your compatriots, then you will unite with other countries because there is no way to overcome a pandemic without such global cooperation. Even if you vaccinate all your, the people in your country, as long as the virus continues to spread in other countries, it will mutate and maybe a new variant, even worse, will come back to your country. So I hope that uh, one of the things that will happen is that people have a better understanding of, of nationalism, not as something which is opposed to global, globalism, and not as something which is mainly about hate, but as something which is mainly about love, and therefore can, in some cases, be completely compatible with global cooperation. Yeah, I'd actually like to build, there's an interesting paradox building what you just said, Yuval, uh, mm -hmm. which is, on the left, progressive people tend to be universalists. They say, I'm a citizen of the world, and they think parochialism and nationalism are bad. Mm. And then they want a strong welfare state, but you can't have <laughs> both. So a strong mm. welfare state is only possible when you have a sense of boundaries, of social contract, we're in this together, we pool our resources, and then those of us who fall down get picked up. This is why Scandinavian societies were so successful. Um, if you break down the boundaries and you say there's no border, it's all humanity, well, then people suddenly don't want to pay taxes to support yep. people on the other side of the planet. So I think you're exactly right that I think the left has really misunderstood nationalism. Obviously, there are toxic forms, of course, but love of country is actually uh, an essential element of a successful redistributive economy there. At least we touched on uh, the inequality question. 
Uh, but I think we have to weave our way through a very difficult paradox to get to a solution. Yeah, I think you, you pointed at, at a very important thing, which is taxes and taxes and nationalism, where you see both the left and the right getting it wrong. Uh, if you tell right-wing people that nationalism, you know what nationalism really is? It's paying your taxes. That's as simple as that. I mean, there, the tendency is to think, oh, patriotism, it's about enlisting in the army and sacrificing my life. Yes, it sometimes is, but quite rarely. Much more typical activity of a good patriot is to pay your taxes honestly so that some other person in your country will get good healthcare and education. If we can get people from the right and the left to agree on that, <laughs> that will be a big step forward. It would be a step forward. And it's not going to happen in my country. Maybe you can make it happen in Israel. <laughs> on that tip, thanks. I'm just going to sneak in one last question as we're getting to the top of the hour from uh, David Lone, if you could uh, come up. Thanks, Claude. And uh, Professor Hari, Professor Haidt, thank you both very much for your time with us today. So my question is that in, uh, in many pockets of the progressive business community, there is a bit of a, uh, a crisis of faith in the, uh, in the capitalist model. Professor Hari, I believe you touched on this briefly earlier. And uh, perhaps principally, there is concern that our short-term profit maximizing behavior, essentially the shareholder model, is incompatible with the long-term social and environmental issues uh, of our time. However, it is a tremendously daunting task to consider how to reform capitalism into a model that is guided by global long-term social and sustainable value. And so my question for you both is, I suppose rather simply, where do we begin and how do we succeed in that, uh, in that endeavor? I want to hear you all first. Oh, um, well, you know, long term, we should try to reimagine a different system, a different set of values, because um, at least traditional capitalism has brought us so far, and we now see its limitations and the problem it's creating. But we don't have the time. It's just too difficult to change quickly enough the kind of core ideas and values of a civilization. Especially if you think about the ecological crisis, we'll have to deal with it with capitalism. It's too late to try something else. So we need to be kind of very, how to work with the beast and not try to work against it. And I would suggest a number, 2%, that if we can get the system to invest 2% of global GDP in developing new eco-friendly technologies and building eco-friendly infrastructure, at least according to many of the experts, this should be enough. You know, if it was 20%, forget it. It's never going to happen. But 2%, it's, it's a big number of global GDP annually. But this is the kind of thing that the capitalist system and also uh, uh, politics is good at shifting. Politicians know how to shift 2% of resources from A to B. So we should focus on that. OK, I would start off by saying that the idea that capitalism is bad or that we'll find another system is, is an impossible dream. And it would actually be a nightmare. Um, the only way that you can create such enormous amounts of value that everyone can be fed uh, is through a free market system um, in which companies are rewarded for producing things that people want. There is no alternative to capitalism. There are only different and better forms of capitalism. And I'm in the business and society program here at Stern. We kind of specialize in exactly what you just asked about, David. We're, all, you know, we're the people, it's, it's a left-leaning department in, in almost every business school. Um, we're the ones who say, you know, shareholder primacy is bad, go stakeholder capitalism. And in general, I agree with that. But what we're seeing as everything is coming apart, at least in the United States, and everything is chaos and narrative warfare, what we're seeing is that as, just as companies committed in 2019 to saying, no more shareholder primacy, we're now all about stakeholder capitalism. That's exactly when they were all exposed to massive pressure from Twitter campaigns. And it, it turns out that what you do is sort of woke signaling driven by your wokest employees. That's no way to run companies. That is no way to solve social problems. So I'm actually no longer a big fan of, or I should just say, I'm rethinking my commitment to, share, to, uh, to stakeholder capitalism because in our current age, 
how, you know, how leadership manages the demands from stakeholders. If there was an intelligent process, it would be great, but there's not an intelligent process. It's a terrible, crazy process. So that's the first thing. Second thing is um, the, the old Milton Friedman point that you're, you know, the, the, the social responsibility of business is to make more money uh, for its shareholders. You know, I, you know, I and many others have criticized that for a long time, but I want to just put it in a positive light, just to be provocative, because it used to be the professors were supposed to be provocative <laughs> before 2015, and I still do it sometimes. Um, actually, Yuval does too. But um, look at it this way. I once heard a, a philosopher say, a healthy capitalist economy is a game that you can only win by making other people better off. And the more I do, the more I do that people want to pay me for, you know, you've seen those graphs of GDP going up, you've seen the rise in living standards. Now, obviously, right now we have market failures. And the fact that, you know, oil companies can make more money by dumping things, you know, that's a, an externality imposed on the rest of us, that has to stop. So I think what we can all agree with, left and right, is there are four major market failures, you know, uh, uh, you know asymmetric information, pub uh, despoiling public goods, um, uh, externalities, um, uh, oh, what's the fourth? Um, uh, oh, I forget. Sorry. Uh, what, what? I should have it right here in front of my wall. Anyway, the point is, the more we, the more we, you know, Facebook is a problem because it is, it is putting, you know, ma massive asymm uh, information asymmetry imposed all on us. It took over public goods, including our general attention, um, and it is damaging a lot of people and a lot of democracies, and it doesn't pay the cost. So we can all agree that capitalism would be much better off if we have smart regulation and incentives that minimize market failures. Thanks. Um, thanks for such an exciting panel uh, with brilliant questions and must say invaluable answers. Um, so just before handing over to Aaron D'Souza to close the 2021 Leading Insights series, I would just like to mention Yuval Noah Harari's new book coming out this month. Um, it is the second volume of Sapiens, A Graphic History, The Pillars of Civilization, using um, Colorful cast of characters, Yuval Noah Harari, David van der Mullen, and Daniel Kassanava take the readers through an exciting journey of our own species, humankind. The book will be released in the UK in just two weeks' time. So thanks again, and um, I will pass on to Aaron D'Souza for a few final words. Thank you, Gerard. Well, uh, what a way to end our Leading Insights series. You know, I was just thinking while you were answering some of those questions, we started this series uh, last year in November. Uh, with uh, Dr. Mohammed Arian, the president of Queen's College, uh, Cambridge. And then we, we went on a journey through entrepreneurship, social innovation, technology, manufacturing, uh, with some of our speakers like Timo Bolt, CEO of Gusto, and, and Samane Pangalos from our, our VP for AstraZeneca. And, you know, for me, this discussion has been one of the most you know, illuminating, most thought-provoking ones uh, that we've had on this whole series. So it's an absolutely I absolutely love the hard questions being asked by, by Professor Haidt uh, and even better answers from Professor Harari. So thank you so much to both of you for really giving it, um, us a great ending to our, to our series. A huge thanks to both Professor Haidt and Professor Harari. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Harari's team, uh, Jekko and the team from Cambridge Filmworks. Um, a big shout out as well to the CGBS team for this session, uh, Ellie Sparrow, Jane Kemp, well, without your hard work behind the scenes, we really made it happen. And our support, of course, from our, our new um, Cambridge uh, Judge Business School Dean, uh, Mara Guilen. Um, my friends here and, and MBA colleagues, Gilad Whale and Avi Zlotti, without, without you guys, this would never have happened. So thank you so much. And of course, uh, to Tim Belitzer, whose energy and enthusiasm with this, with this series has really made it happen. Um, and a really big final thanks to uh, you guys, the audience, us, us, my fellow students, uh, and of course, the new cohort. Uh, because without you, without an audience, without people who are engaging with, with our series and giving us the good feedback and saying that this is, this is what they wanted, uh, we would not have done this. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much um, for attending all of our sessions. I hope you've enjoyed it. We might do something again in the future. Let's see what, what happens. Um, but for now, thank you so much. Have a great evening. And once again, thank you to Professor Hyde, to Professor Hari for such a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.